I want to talk this morning about a cover-up. And then I want to talk about conviction, confrontation, and consequences of sin. Last time we saw how David committed adultery and how this sin was conceived in the heart of David. Instead of going to battle with his men as God had anointed him to do, David decided to take it easy. Instead of the battlefield, he's in his bedroom resting. He is idle. He lays aside his armor. He fails to follow the path of duty, which always leads to spiritual decline. Let me just say that again. When we fail to follow the path of duty, it will always lead to a spiritual decline. David is vulnerable. He takes a stroll upon his roof and looks over the balcony of his palace and his eyes fall upon a beautiful woman. The Bible calls her beautiful, so you know that she was a 10. Her name was Bathsheba. And he sees her as she bathes. She's bathing. David's look was not wrong within itself. It was innocent enough at first. But instead of just seeing Bathsheba bathe and turning away, he, he enjoys it. He enjoys looking. He wallows in it. A fire is lit, leading him to inquire of her he begins to ask questions about who this woman is. And so David ignores the clear admonition of God's word. He ignores every warning. He, his servant even tries to tell him that, you know, Bathsheba's married David. And in fact, he was married to one of David's trusted mighty men. But by then, the fantasy had taken a power it had taken on a power that began to control him. That's how it happens. He brings Bathsheba to his bedroom and just thinking that it would be a one night stand, thinking that he could get by with it. He sends her home. A month goes by, maybe two, when the chilling consequences of his sin is revealed, turning his entire world upside down. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse five says, and the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Folks, sooner or later, the chickens come home to roost. Make no mistake about it. The Bible says in Numbers chapter 32, verse 23, be sure your sin will find you out. It was so with David and Bathsheba, and it, it, it is so with any of us. We're no better than David. It is true of all of us. And so now comes the day of reckoning. David and Bathsheba are in dire straits. The situation uh, was, was a crisis in that culture. The penalty for adultery was death by stoning according to the law of Moses. And Bathsheba had plenty of reason to be fearful because when her unfaithfulness is discovered by her husband Uriah, he will have the right by law to have her stoned. And although David, by virtue of his position as king, might escape the stoning part, his guilt will be proclaimed abroad, weakening his power as king, damaging his great reputation that had been good till this point, and possibly even stirring up a revolt. So David has a decision to make. He could do one of two things. He could, number one, he could fall on his face before God. He could confess his sin. He could repent, declare this is sin to the nation, which is what he should have done. Or number two, this is what he did, cover it up. Taking the, 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 the root of, de of, of deception and hypocrisy. And of course, he chooses to cover it up, to take the road 
of hypocrisy and deception. And so what follows, what I'm going to tell you about is the story of David's cover-up. David will try to hide his sin, but he will soon discover you cannot escape God's judgment. Your sin will find you out. So let's look at the cover-up. David's plan was to bring Bathsheba's husband home from the battle for a few days, have him spend a night or two at home with her, and then everyone would think, hey, this is Uriah's baby. <laughs> Sound like a good plan, did not it? Verse 7 says of chapter 11 says, when, And when Uriah was coming to him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the world prospered. David is in deception mode. <laughs> he tries to appear to be concerned about the war to hide his real motivation for bringing Uriah home. He tells Uriah to go home thinking he will be with his beautiful wife. Seems like a good plan. Nobody will ever know what David and Bathsheba did, but David had a problem. You see, Uriah was too patriotic to enjoy his wife while his countrymen were endangering their lives on the battlefield. So he slept in the barracks with the king's servants. So David's plan doesn't work. He, he had failed to estimate aright the sterling qualities of a man with, whom he was, with the man he was dealing with. Uriah was not one to give way to self-indulgence while his brethren were enduring the hardships of a military campaign. So David moves on like we all do. Plan A doesn't work. We got to go to plan B. Plan B. Ah. The plan which David now resorts to was horrible. David makes Uriah drunk. Hoping that while uh, Uriah's blood is heated, he will go home to be with his, wife, with his wife. But again, he failed. Let me just say this. Uriah drunk proved to be a better man than David sober. Huh? For once again, he would not go home. Sin will make a good man with integrity. A godly man, a giant killer, a man anointed by God even. Like David, a low down deceiving scoundrel. Because that's what he's becoming. Sin does this. It's not da David's our hero. David has killed the giant. David has been showed such restraint. David is God's man. But now, look what sin has caused. So, uh, so plan A doesn't work. Plan B does not work. So then the panic-stricken king comes up with plan C. Now he deliberately plots the death of his devoted subject. He had rather that innocent blood be shed and his whole army be threatened than it is all, and so that his own good name would be preserved and it, it, he wouldn't be made out as a scandal. 2 Samuel 11, verse 14 says, And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. Wow. What cold-blooded deliberation. David pens a note to the commander of his army telling him to station his faithful soldier in the place where he would be most vulnerable, most exposed to the enemy, and to leave him there to his cruel fate. I mean, that is, that's low. Oh, my goodness. The king's letter decreeing his death was carried. Listen to this. Uriah is carrying it himself, and he's going to deliver this to General Job. David sent the man with his own death warrant in his hand. And listen, David trusted him that he wouldn't open it up and look at it. That's how much he trusted him. And he delivers it. And Joab, Joab did as the king had bidden and Uriah was slain. David's abominable plan succeeds. The, the, the man, Uriah, whose accusations David feared so much now lays in a silent death committed to an honorable an honorable grave. Do you see what 
Do you see what lengths sin will take us when we yield to its pull? Adultery now occasions murder. And we want to say, I mean, he, David's, this is the man after God's own heart. We, we, we want to say, no, David, no. This is insane, David. Don't do this. Not the man after God's own heart. Not the giant killer. Not the anointed one. It can't be. But it is. It is. Sin will cause you to do things you never dreamed you would ever do. It'll take you further than you ever thought you would ever go. And by the way, are you keeping track of David's sin? Lust? Adultery? Hypocrisy, deception, murder. How, how could a man after God's own heart do such things? We, we, we want to ask how, but let me just, if, you go, if you'll be honest, and if I will be honest, well, then you would know, you would know that it could happen to you. It could happen to me. The, the human heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And if left to ourselves, who knows what we would do. But thank God he hasn't left us to ourselves. But oh, don't ever think. Don't ever think. Ah, I could never do such a thing. If it were not for the grace of God, who knows where we would be today. That's why we must always guard our hearts. Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 17, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. <laughs> Never think it couldn't happen to you. Never think you're beyond sin's tentacles. Be on guard, be sober, be vigilant, watch and pray. And as we talked about last time, make no provision for the flesh. Take drastic measures if necessary. Notice the hypocrisy, and then I want you to notice the callousness of David's message to Joab after his dastardly deed. It says in verse 25 of chapter 11, Then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. Now consider, consider the depths of sin. It destroys the tenderness of the heart. It makes one cold, hard, and calloused. It destroys the sweetness of the soul. Have you ever seen anybody backslidden and the heart becomes calloused and cold? Have you ever seen a bitter person? Uriah is just another statistic as well as the soldiers who would have died. Listen, folks, when one comes to this point of callousness, of hardness, only a move of God, the Holy Ghost, can touch and break that heart. Verse 27 of chapter 11 says, And when the morning, the grieving was past, David sent and fetched her, Bathsheba, to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. So now the cover-up, uh, it, it appears to be complete. To the casual observer, all is well. David has gotten by with this. His wife, he's got a new wife, happy life. All seems well on the throne and in the palace. Oh, but it's not. The last part of the verse says something we need to pay close attention to. It says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The thing that David had done had displeased the Lord. David thinks he's getting by, but God sees what's happening. And with these words, with these words... We are introduced to a new character in the drama of David and Bathsheba. One who has thus far not been mentioned, and I'm talking about God himself. 
He is absent from the text until now. When David lusts after Bathsheba, there's no mention of God. When he seduces her, there's no mention of God. When he plots, there's no mention of God. When Uriah is buried, when he takes Bathsheba as his wife, there's still no mention of God. But oh, now there is. And if we would only read the first half of verse 27, we might think, well, this cover-up thing worked. All is well. Bathsheba and David are married. They pick out a name for their baby and they decorate the nursery and David dodges a bullet. God has turned his head. At least David is hoping. But just when it appears all is well, out from the curtain steps the Lord himself and now he will take center stage the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. God will be silent no more. Charles Spurgeon says God does not allow his children to sin successfully. Oh, you, you can sin. God doesn't keep us from sin, but he will not allow you to sin successfully. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covereth hides his sins shall not prosper. So we see the cover up. And now I want you to look at the conviction. Thank God for conviction. Thank God for conviction. The Bible tells us there is pleasure in sin for a season. My goodness, if it were not so, we would not be tempted to sin. Yes, there is pleasure but it's only for a season. You see, in the end, there's a knife. Oh, there's a negative. Always. Hmm. Soon, David finds out that the way of a transgressor is hard. Guilt begins to simmer in his heart. You ever been there? Oh. David knew he had sinned. We usually do. Deep down inside, we know. We know, but like David, we try to ignore it or we try to rationalize it. No doubt, David is rationalizing, well, I'm, I'm the king, I, I do, I can get by with this stuff. I, or, or, or as we all like to do, it, it was, it's really Bathsheba's fault. She, she, she shouldn't have been out there like that. She shouldn't have, she's culpable. Huh. But so was he. Hmm. And he might have thought, well, who, who, who's this hurting, really? I mean, so men, men have to die in battle. It's just, it's just the way it is. Why? Uriah is just another one. That, you see, the possibilities available to help us excuse our sin are endless. They are readily available. Mine, you can come up with a lot of good excuses. Well, they're not good, but they are excuses. But something keeps gnawing at David in the pit of his stomach and emptiness he could not describe. You ever felt that? Oh, come on now. None of you all don't act like you're all angels. Oh, I felt that gnawing. I felt that conviction. I thank God I have. I thank God for it. An emptiness. Ever felt that emptiness? Oh, it's like, oh, where's God? I'm empty. I feel lonely. And then he's accompanied by extreme depression. He later would write three psalms describing those months out of fellowship with God. And as he was back in his backslidden state, Psalms 32, 38, and 51. Later, we can get to Psalm 51, which is, talks about his repentance. But Psalms 32, let me read a little bit of what it says in verse 3. It says, when I, David saying, when I kept silence, I mean, I kept it inside. I didn't confess it. When I did kept it inside, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night, thy hand was heavy upon me. David is saying, when I was unwilling to confess my sin, when I attempted to hide it, he had hoped, he had hoped that the conviction would just die away, that it would leave him, but he couldn't find any kind of relief. The sleepless nights, the haunted memories, the agony, the burden was constant day and night. Why? God just kept bringing it up. 
God wouldn't let it go. Verse 2 of chapter uh, 38 says, uh, For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. Verse 6 says, I am troubled, and I bow down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. Let's let those words sink in. It describes the state of, state of mind common to those who have sinned against God. To the backslider, they, they, they know they have sinned, but they're unwilling to make confession. They attempt to conceal it. They put it off. They endeavor to divert their minds and they turn their thoughts to, from, from, from the pain of guilt by, by keeping busy or, or by amusement or pleasure or drugs or alcohol. And all that happens is they plunge deeper and deeper into sin. I know this feeling. I know what David was feeling. I felt these things. As a young man running from God, I tried to ignore the pain, the guilt. But the prayers of my mother haunted me day and night. Thank God for a praying mother. I would come home from the weekend of indulgence and it seemed Sunday night when everyone else was gone, everybody had gone home, I'd be all alone and his hand pressed to me sore. I would turn on the television set and these were the days before cable stations where there were so many of them and I I would find myself watching at 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock on a Sunday night watching Christian programming and that arrows would pierce my heart. I mourned. I can remember fighting those days and fighting the conviction and not wanting to give in and thinking, I can't do this. But God would not relent. And I thank God that he never took his hand off of me. David had grievously displeased the Lord. But God... Is faithful. This brings us to the confrontation. We've talked about the cover up. We've talked about the conviction. But now we come to the confrontation. David lived that way with this heaviness, this burden for nearly a year. He had Bathsheba, but the pleasure was gone. That's how sin is. Like, what did I do that for? It's gone. No rest for the soul. Then came a knock on the palace door. God sent Nathan, the prophet, to King David. The prophet's task was far from being an enviable one. To meet the guilty king alone face to face, no easy task. And he walks slowly and sadly and painfully toward the palace. He carries the message that he'd rather not carry. He has the most distressing task a servant of God will ever have to, 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 to have, and one that he must endure, and that is exposing sin in the lives of people. Who wants that? Who wants to preach a message like that? Because it makes people uncomfortable. And who wants to make people feel that way? Especially those people you love. Often the preacher is sent forth with a message he well knows, he well knows will be most unpalatable, most unpleasant to the hearer. The temptation is to tone it down, to take it, take it off its, its sharp edge. Uh, little do God's people realize what it costs the minister of the gospel who is faithful to his calling. Think of it. Think of it. The apostle Paul, who, who was bolder than he? But he felt the need to ask for prayer that utterance may be given unto him that he may open his mouth boldly. How much more do God's servants today need the support and the prayer of their brothers and sisters in Christ? Because on every side, the cry now is for tolerance, for political correctness. And the way they said it, political correctness and, and tolerance in the days of, 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 of the prophets was this. Speak to us smooth things. Yeah. 
But thank God Nathan did not decline the unwelcome task. But he executed it faithfully. However, he did not immediately come in and charge David with his crime, saying, there you, 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 you low down. No, he didn't do that. Instead, he approached his conscience indirectly by means of a parable, causing David to really pass judgment on himself without being aware of it. David has no idea what's about to happen. And Nathan begins to tell the story. And let me read it to you in chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and, he, and, and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save One little ewe lamb, which he had brought, bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his own bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress by the wayfaring man that was coming to him but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. Now take note of what happens here. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man and he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. The deed was so selfish, so, so uh, heartless, so atrocious that, that David, David says, says his anger just flashes with fury and he's full of indignation and he shouts a royal decree. That man that did that, he's going to die. And they, then Nathan says to David, from our morning text in verse 7, Thou art the man. Thou art the man. So skillful. Had the parable been delivered up to this point, David has no suspicion that he was the rich man who acted so despicably. Now he stands self-condemned. Here's something we all to all consider. We need to be careful when we pass judgment. We might just be passing it on ourselves. Thou art the man, David. It pierced his heart like a dagger. You, David, you, the one I anointed to be king of Israel, you, the one that survived the agony of 10 years from running from Saul, you who had several wives, you had plenty. Why did you need another man's wife? You, you, you did far worse than adult. You murdered the husband. Then you tried to hide it, cover it up. Thou art the man, David. There was silence in the throne room. King David's countenance was changed instantly from, from, from outrage and anger to agony and disbelief. Had he confessed his sin to God in the first place and not tried to hide it, it would have been over, but... No, he thinks I'm the king. I can get by with this. He thought like many people think I can live like hell. I can live any way that I want to and get away with it. But you can't sooner or later. Your sin will find you out. So we've seen the cover up, the conviction, the confrontation. Now look with me. If you will, let the consequences, verse 10 through 12, reveal the consequences as God says through the prophet. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. And it was so. Just like God said, the sentence, you can read the next chapter, chapter 13, and you can read of the murder of David's son, Ammon, who had been encouraged, by the way, in his crime, by following his father's example of lusting, and he raped Tamar. And then Absalom's, uh, David's other son, would have Ammon murdered. And then Absalom would eventually be killed. And then David, in his final hours, when naming Solomon as his successor, he, he was passing the death sentence on Adonijah, his eldest surviving son. What a horrifying choice he has to make. However, if he had not made that choice, Bathsheba and her four sons would have been doubtless killed. Let me tell you something. Sin will put you in a pickle. 
Sin has its consequences. Verse 11, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto the, thy neighbor and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son for thou didst it secretly. But I will do this thing before all of Is all Israel and before the son. All of this happened exactly as God said. In fact, Absalom endeavored to take the throne of his father. He didn't succeed. But can you imagine the heartache as David saw all this take place? Verse 13, chapter 12, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Wow, this is where he needed to be. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. God is faithful. Thou shalt not die, howbeit because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. You see, David, he will repent. It's beautiful and God is faithful. Psalm 51 describes it. I hope we can get there throughout this Christmas season sometime during this next month. That being said, it doesn't change the fact even though we can repent and God does forgive and he is faithful, we reap what we sow. My, did David ever reap? As well, even worse, he gave occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Oh, I think that would be the most horrifying part. In closing, before the days of when forensic science was so sophisticated, a woman murdered her husband by driving a nail in his head. The authorities suspected nothing. She was a church goer. She, was, she sung in the choir. But then 30 years later, they were building a highway over a graveyard where her husband had been buried. They were digging up the graves and then they were reburying the people. And when they dug up her husband's grave, the wooden rotten box collapsed. And there they found a nail in his skull. The sheriff went to her house. And when she opened the door, he showed her the nail. Instantly, she put her head in her hands and said, my God, I've been caught. After all these years, I've been caught. Be sure your sin will find you out. Perhaps, perhaps right now the Holy Spirit is digging up things in your past, things you've tried to hide and refuse to confess and repent of. I'm not talking about things repented of. I'm talking about things you've tried to hide. The Bible says when the Holy Spirit comes, he will reprove the world of sin. Yes, my friend, he is the comforter, but be sure he is the convictor of sin. He will point at the sin and iniquity in our lives Endeavoring to get us to confess and forsake it, not to confess to me, confess to him. Please, please don't make the mistake that David made and try to hide, try to cover it up. Here's what the Bible says in Proverbs 28, 13. You can be sure this is true. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. I want mercy. Oh, I want mercy. And I can tell you, I've needed mercy. so do you it's available 
But when the Holy Spirit shouts out, thou art the man, you must confess and forsake your sin. You cannot prosper without it. There is no blessing where there is unconfessed sin. So I ask you, is the Holy Spirit shouting, thou art the man, thou art the woman? Is the Holy Spirit reminding you of unconfessed sin? Is the heavy hand of God upon you? Do you feel the arrows as they pierce your heart? Are you tired of the heavy burden of a sinful life? Well, then the solution is acknowledge your sin now. Confess your sins today. And our merciful God will forgive you. First John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, not some, but all unrighteousness.